Uh, good morning. I'm Michael Lind, the Policy Director of the Economic Growth Program uh, here at the New America Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you to this event uh, on the publication of the new book, Innovation Economics, The Race for Global Advantage, uh, by Rob Atkinson, uh, the founder and uh, president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation and uh, senior uh, analyst at the uh, ITIF, Stephen Azell. Uh, in this election season, as in uh, most, issues ranging from uh, manufacturing, trade, uh, government policies to stimulate innovation are central uh, to the presidential campaigns as well as to uh, other campaigns uh, around for Congress and the Senate. Uh, it, and a lot, it, frequently, uh, we get sound bites and uh, slogans uh, and ideological approaches to these issues, uh, so it's a, a great pleasure and a privilege uh, to have Rob Atkinson here, uh, who's widely recognized one of America's leading experts, both on innovation and on uh, technology policy and manufacturing uh, in the United States and the world, uh, here to help explore some of these issues. Uh, the format of this presentation will be as follows. Uh, Rob will uh, give a brief discussion of innovation economics. Uh, then we will have a uh, brief conversation exploring some of the issues he raises in his presentation. Uh, following that, we will move to uh, questions and discussion with you in the audience. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Rob Atkinson. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Mike. You, I, first of all, really, really am glad to be here. And, and um, you know, sometimes when, when, when at least when we're trying to do our work in this area of, of uh, uh, I don't even want to call it heterodox economic because that implies something else, but sort of an economic view of the world that is in the decided minority, uh, it's really been a great pleasure to, to know Mike because we, we share the same view and we, we, we go out and have lunch together and, and cry over our wine and, uh, and how uh, uh, we're, we're, we're in the minority view. So you'll see that today when, when, I, when, when I talk about it. So anyway, so what I want to talk about today um, uh, rather than just sort of a, I, I want to do a little bit different presentation than I've done a couple of times on the book before. And I, what I want to talk about is really two fundamental things. One is how the U.S. has fallen behind in the last decade in a very serious, structural, uh, not cyclical way, and how that has been a contributing, if not major, factor in the uh, financial crisis and in the current uh, unprecedented anemic recovery. And then rather than go into a lot of detail about what to do, which I actually think is really not very important fundamentally, I don't think it's uh, an issue of not knowing what to do. I think if we were to assemble 10 or 20 experts who think about this issue from a structural innovation perspective, we'd come up with pretty much all the same answers. The real question is why aren't we doing it? And I want to focus a little bit on that. Okay. So that's what happened. The economy crashed. Really, uh, again, unprecedented collapse. Uh, nobody predicted it. We, it was what we're here. Uh, why did it collapse? Because we were investing in housing. If you look at the Case Shiller 10 and 20 city index, what you saw was starting in 2000, this unprecedented uh, rise of housing prices way, way above their historical average, their historical growth. So this anomaly. All this money pouring into housing, and then obviously that wasn't sustainable. Well, real question is not why didn't people see it? That's actually an interesting question. Uh, but the more important one is why did this happen? Why did all of this money go into housing? And in theory, people who were being paid enormous amounts of money on Wall Street, who are supposedly uh, the best and the brightest, just simply had a failure of massive proportions. I mean, uh, people who were, you know, PhDs and quants and all this stuff, and they just failed. And why was that? I think it's, as I said, it's because the well of investment, if you will, dried up. So what do we mean that? We essentially went from making things uh, to making money. So the, you know, there's a great line by Calvin Coolidge back in the 20s, the business of America is business. Uh, and actually, that was a really apt assessment. And now the business of America is making money. It's very different. So what do I mean by that? Well, just a good example. If you look at the ratio of commercial and industrial loans to uh, consumer loans, 
What you find is increasingly lending institutions were not making uh, co industrial commercial loans. They were making consumer loans, cars, homes. And why does that matter? That matters because homes are not an investment. Cars are not an investment. If I buy a new home, I'm not more productive. If I buy a new car, I'm not more productive. If I invest in a new machine, or I invest in a new piece of software, I become more productive, the economy becomes productive. It's an investment, essentially, that pays off, in theory, with higher net present value. Housing doesn't do that. So you see this in the 90s. You can see that there was an increase in corporate investment in machinery and equipment. Let's see. Uh, anyway, it doesn't do that. OK, over there, the blue line. And it increased much, much faster than housing. And what you saw in the first half of the 2000s is that there was a big, big decline of demand by U.S. corporations for money. They just simply didn't need as much money anymore from Wall Street, from banks, because they weren't investing anymore. The growth of investment in new machinery and equipment by U.S. companies went to its lowest level in, since the Great Depression. Uh, you can see this here, just, just in five years, the growth of private in investment in equipment and software. In other words, this is all the stuff that we invest in, make the economy more productive, grew 81%. In the last 11 years, it grew 20%. It's actually negative since 2006. So you can see this also, venture capital. Venture capital fell significantly. IPOs, initial public offerings, fell significantly. Why did all of this fall? Why was there less demand for real investment capital of what Wall Street historically provided? It was the, that was Wall Street's core function, was to amass and collect capital, and then to find the best places in the economy to invest it. Which they didn't do. They didn't invest it. They spent it. And a big reason for that is that US companies were still investing. They just weren't doing it in the US as much. Uh, this is essentially the, um, that blue line reflects the ratio of investments by U.S. companies overseas uh, versus domestically. And what you can see, it doubled. Uh, there's a recent uh, announcement the other day about, uh, the ma about 30 major semiconductor builds in the, US, in the world by U.S. companies. Only, I think, believe two are happening now in the U.S. So global multinational U.S. companies have an enormous array of options and they're investing increasingly outside the US. There's another interesting, this is a data set that looks at how many new expansions or relocations there are of big industrial companies, big uh, corporate headquarters, regional headquarters, these kinds of things. So a facility like an insurance company is gonna open up in Iowa, or a factory is gonna open up in Dallas. And what you can see, again, very significant drop in the number of these because they're not happening in the U.S. to the extent they used to happen. Same thing with, uh, corporate, uh, with, with uh, foreign direct investment. Inward foreign direct investment fell. Outward foreign direct investment dramatically increased. So again, U.S. becoming a, a less competitive place for investment. Now, one of the biggest areas we see that change in is in manufacturing. We had the largest loss of manufacturing employment that we've ever had in the 240-year American history in 10 years. So we had a loss of manufacturing jobs greater than the Great Depression. So in the Great Depression, from the peak to the very bottom of the Great Depression, we lost about 31% of our manufacturing jobs. Here we lost 33%. And by the way, they were the losses in the Great Depression uh, versus here, they were about 15 times more concentrated in manufacturing. So in the Great Depression, we were losing jobs in everything. Retail, wholesale, banking, manufacturing. In this last decade, the losses were very, very concentrated in manufacturing. Now, some people are going to argue that you may be thinking of yourself. Well, this is not really a problem because we lost those jobs because of high productivity. Manufacturers become increasingly productive as they put in new, new machines, new computer-aided design, et cetera, et cetera, and they just don't need workers. 
Uh, I don't have that slide, so I'll explain it to you. The reality is U.S. manufacturing output, so this is inflation-adjusted output, how many widgets they're producing in 2000 versus how many they're producing at the end of 2010, uh, when measured properly, and I'm happy to go into details on what that means, when measured properly actually declined 11%. Again, that's never happened in American history that we can discern where we've lost output in a decade. One of the indicators of that, which again, I don't have the slide, um, historically U.S. manufacturers added capital stock every decade. So every year they would add more machines, more widget uh, makers, more software. And the BEA, Bureau of Economic Analysis, just adds that up and tells you every year how much capital stock manufacturers have. And basically, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, the average rate was between 35 and 55 percent expansion of capital stock. So in other words, every decade, at the end of the decade, manufacturing capital stock is a lot bigger. This decade was essentially zero. Again, first time that's ever happened. So really, something unprecedented happened, which has never, ever happened in our history before. And one of the places we see that is in the trade balance. So what was happening? What was happening was we were facing intense global competition, not just for um, commodity t-shirts, not just for call centers, not just for widgets, but for the highest value added production in the world. And that's a good reflection of that. We, the only reason this goes up is because we stopped buying, not because we became any more competitive, and that number is just continuing going on. So in other words, we started to run massive trade deficits. We now run a hundred, about a hundred and ten billion dollar trade deficit in high technology products. So in the 90s, when we started to run a somewhat a serious trade deficit here, the story that Washington told itself was, look, don't worry about that stuff because we're still really, really good at high technology. And in 2000, we were. We were running a $100 billion trade deficit in high technology products. Now, we've lost that. We're running a $100 billion deficit. And as you'll hear, the new story is, don't worry about that. We're doing R&D and we're doing design. Look at Apple. I'll explain that in a little bit. So, lest you say, well, manufacturing doesn't matter, which I'll explain. This is a study we did that looked at 44 countries, and it looked at things like how many new business startups uh, do you have in your country? How much venture capital do you have? How many scientists and engineers? How much corporate R&D? How much government R&D? How, how high is your productivity? And what we did is we looked at all of those together. We combined them into one metric, and then we said, where were countries in 2000, and where were they in 2011? Who made the most progress? The United States made the second to least uh, progress, only behind Italy. So in other words, every single country except Italy made faster progress on things like adding to venture capital, adding to corporate R&D, adding to scientists and engineers. Now you can say, well, China doesn't matter because they started from a low base. Sure, that's true. But look at the countries that are in there that didn't start from a low base. Japan, Austria. Finland. You know, I'm going to ask you a question, but you're going to know the answer because whenever you ask a question, it's always a trick question. What country grew faster in the last decade in per worker income, Japan or the United States? Now, how many people think it's Japan? How many people think it's the United States? How many people have no clue what I just said? <laughs> okay. It's Japan. World Bank study just came out. It's Japan. Japan had faster per worker income. Now, why do we find that a surprise? Because Japan is losing a percent of its population, or a percentage of its workforce every year because Japan is aging so rapidly. We're gaining workers because we have higher fertility and we have higher immigration. So our economy looks like it's doing better just because we just have more people growing. But if you look at what really matters, which is per worker income change. That's the single most important indicator of economic success. Japan outperforms us. Okay, so why, what happened here? What happened here was essentially companies went from, after the post-war period, they started shopping the state. So after World War II, 
GM started saying, you know what, I don't need to, we don't need to be in Michigan, we can be in Georgia, we can be in Alabama. Uh, GE said, we don't need to be in Schenectady, we can be in, uh, in New Mexico. But what happened in the last decade is that changed and they went to shopping the world. That's really the fundamental change. Companies now have, are, are, you know, Sam Palmisano wrote that famous, book, a famous article about the globally integrated enterprise. That's really what it is. It's now enterprises that are just, you know, to all intents and purposes are global in nature. The entire world is their production platform. Now you can have a discussion about whether you think that's moral or right or whatever. It sort of doesn't matter because that's what's happening. The other component there, so you had this, essentially this emergence of a global production system, partly through IT, enabled connected supply chains. But the other reason you had this is because in the last decade, countries woke up and said, we want to win in the highest value added production. You know, a decade ago, it wasn't that long ago that Europeans were actually talking about saving their shipbuilding industry, their steel industry, and their coal industry. They don't talk about that anymore. What they talk about is how are we going to be the world leader in nanotechnology, robotics, clean energy, uh, advanced manufacturing, and, and the like. And that's pretty much what almost every country now has done. Uh, Nigeria, no, sorry, Ghana, of all places, just came out with a high technology strategy about two years ago. So what these countries are doing is they're putting in place a suite of policies that essentially is a sign that says, if you're a high value added producer of goods or services, you should locate in our country. And we're gonna do things for you, like we're gonna have much, much lower corporate taxes. The US now has anywhere between the sixth to first highest effective corporate tax rate, not just statutory, effective corporate tax rate in the world. We now have the 27th most generous R&D tax credit in the world, down from number one about 15 years ago. Other countries have expanded their support for science, technology, and research anywhere, in most cases, twice as fast as America, but in many cases, four times, six times, ten times faster. United States, uh, you see the same thing on uh, university R&D. Again, if I were to ask you, do American universities, are they in the top five in the world in uh, government and corporate support for scientific research at universities. How many people are gonna raise your hand? A lot. Actually, we're 22nd in the world. So we, we, and everybody, we were surprised when we found that. So, Phil, uh, there's a study on our website if you wanna see it. Anyway, uh, there's a, you know, very good OECD data, which I'm happy to share that study with anybody who wants to look at it, but we're 22nd. Other countries in the last decade said, we're going to put a boatload of money into our universities and we're going to tie it to commercialization. We're going to try to get as many new companies. We're going to try to get discoveries and out into the marketplace. But the other thing that these countries are doing is they're supplementing these good policies with a suite of bad policies. And by that, we essentially mean what we've termed in the book innovation mercantilism. In the old days, company, countries would do things, oh, we want to save the shoe industry, we're going to slap on big shoe tariffs. Now they're a lot more sophisticated, and what they do are things like China's Indigenous Innovation Program, which is a whole suite of policies around manipulated government procurement, manipulated product standards, manipulated forced technology transfer. Uh, the Indians now have a new program that is about to be rolled out, we fear called PMA, Preferential Market Access, where the Indian government has said by 2020, we're going to have a requirement that 80% of all computer equipment is made in India, that's consumed in India. So this is not about just sort of fair trade and in competing fairly, this is a whole suite of policies that countries are saying, you know, these other guys have these advanced technology industries, we want them, we're gonna get them now, we're gonna cheat. So, all of that's gone on and the US essentially has failed to respond. We have not cut our corporate tax rate, we have not essentially increased the R&D credit, we have been essentially stagnant on, corporate, on government support for research and development. We have not really responded on high skill immigration. We haven't really responded on a national policy for producing more scientists and engineers. 
They haven't, there's no national policy in any serious way to transfer technology. So we haven't responded. Now the question is why haven't, um, I won't go through that. So why haven't we responded? I really should say U.S. is not, it's Cuba. So Cuba hasn't responded either. Um, why haven't we responded? So there's a lot of reasons, but I'm going to basically just focus on one and then wrap up. I think the single biggest reason we haven't responded is because of what you could call this Washington economic consensus. And for those of you who know, this term was coined by uh, Oliver Williamson a few years ago. Uh, it was Williamson. Um, to, to sort of say, look, there's the right way of doing economic growth policy and there's the wrong way. We get it right. All you other people around the world get it wrong. And that economic, uh, Washington economic consensus is really grounded in uh, a branch of economics. I shouldn't even say a branch. It's sort of like the entire tree uh, called neoclassical economics. So most economists, if we want to walk three blocks over here to AEI or six blocks over here to Brookings, doesn't really matter what think tank you go to in Washington, with the exception of New America and, and ITIF probably, you're going to be talking to neoclassical economists. Now why is that a problem? But, by the way, it's not even you're talking to them, it's as Keynes once said, uh, most policymakers are channeling long dead economists. Here, most policymakers are channeling alive economists. So when you talk to a policymaker on the Hill or in the White House, they have internalized in their mind essentially this neoclassical frame. Now, that's a problem because we, the problem with neoclassical frame is it simply can't even acknowledge that we have a problem. So, you know, the first step of acknowledging and fixing a problem if you're an alcoholic, at least I've been told this, is you're supposed to admit that you're an alcoholic and then you start treatment. Well, if you're a failed competitor, the first step is to admit, we are a failed competitor. Neoclassical economics is incapable of admitting that because in the neoclassical model, as long as you don't distort prices and restrict entry and exit to markets, markets always get it right and produce optimal outcomes. So by definition, it's a completely circular logic. The outcome that we have has to be optimal. So now we look at all of those facts that I've put up there, and what you'll see is neoclassical economists spin them, interpret them, to essentially say that is actually a good outcome. Because if it was not a good outcome, that is fundamentally strikes at the very heart of neoclassical economics. It means something is wrong. It means that even though we didn't distort prices here, even though the U.S. market is the most open in the world for entry and exit, something went wrong. That simply cannot be in the neoclassical model. So what you have is um, uh, you have a set of essentially uh, excuses. One of the things that we talk about in the book, was, uh, which to us was so it's pretty eye-opening actually, we, uh, in writing the book we did a lot of research on the United Kingdom because we were trying to find a country that had failed uh, economically, I mean, not like a basket case uh, failure of uh, corruption like you know, Rwanda or something like that, but a, you know, a leading country that was doing pretty well and fell behind, declined deindustrialized. And the UK is the poster child of that. The UK essentially led the world, with the exception of the US, in the post-war period and just failed. And particularly in this period about 65 to 85 was really when bad things happened. And so when you go and you look at virtually all of the literature about UK industrial decline in that period, there's a lot of books written, a lot of scholarly articles, uh, what you find is actually very interesting is that we came up with 20 leading explanations of UK failure. And then we said, does the US have any of those characteristics? And in fact, it had 19 and a half of those, essentially more or less all of them. So every single thing the UK did wrong, defend their strong currency, uh, uh, not admit that manufacturing is important, uh, labor management conflicts, et cetera, et cetera. We did all of them. We're doing all of them. But 
The real interesting one to me is the UK's dominance of neoclassical economics. So neoclassical economics is largely an Anglo-Saxon thing. You go to Europe, or continental Europe, it's a much, much weaker. So it's a wonderful uh, art, a book by, uh, by uh, a guy named uh, Pollard. And he writes, uh, quote, it may well be that the very quality of post-war UK economics, the greater sophistication of its theoretical constructions, its much refined statistical and econometric methods, have put it out of touch with real economic situations. Economic theory as it has developed in the Anglo-Saxon world turns out to have been a handicap rather than an aid to good policy. It's, you look at all of that, greater sophistication of theoretical and reliance on statistical and econometric methods, that is U.S. economics. I encourage you to go sometime and look at any scholarly economics journal, and if you can understand it, more power to you, because it's largely all mathematics now. So another great quote I love by Pollard, he says, um, in the, uh, in the 60s, it um, uh, says, comments in reference to the attitude of British economists towards the French policies to steer investment towards high-tech industries like uh, steel at the time high-tech. He says, quote, such a plan would have been thought to be much beneath the dignity of British economists trained to think in macro figures. They would have left such tasks to hacks and East Europeans. <laughs> and uh, that's pretty much what we have here. They leave such tasks to hacks like me. Uh, so why is that a problem? Because when you then go out and sort of have to go to the first fundamental question, not whether we're in decline, but whether we even compete. So that's really the first question. Are we competing with other countries? What you find is that, Michael, is that a sign? No, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> I'm almost done. Uh, what you find is that neoclassical economists simply will be in denial that we compete with other countries. Paul Krugman on the left says, quote, the notion that nations compete is incorrect. Nations are not to any important degree in competition with one another. He said that this year. Jane Gravel, Congressional Research Service, says competitiveness is a term without meaning. Kevin Hassett, conservative AEI economist, says non-economists regularly appeal to competitors when motivating a wide array of policies, while economists, what he means by that is neoclassical economists, pr protest or look the other way. So neoclassical economists just simply say that we're not in competition. For them, Boeing competes with Airbus, but we don't compete with Europe. Now, why do they say that? They say that because in their mind, if Boeing goes out of business because it's competing with Airbus, and by the way, it's not competing with Airbus, it's competing with Airbus and the European governments. But if Boeing goes out of business, as long as we have open markets, as long as we let uh, uh, bankruptcy courts redispose Boeing assets, and as long as we don't try to keep Boeing holding on to those workers, we will be better off. We will be better off because those workers will flow into new occupations and new industries and higher value added things. There's only one problem with that, which is that aircraft production is the highest value added industry in America. So really hard to imagine how when you lose aircraft production, you can go into something that is even more high value added. So if competitiveness is not a problem, then obviously the trade deficit can't be a problem. So we're running the largest trade deficit in world history. And uh, that, to me, is a symptom that suggests perhaps there's a problem. But no, you can ignore that, wipe that away if you're a neoclassical economist. Again, I can, 20 quotes if I want, wanted to, but let me give you two. Uh, former uh, Bush II economist Greg Mankiw says, uh, the trade deficit is not a problem. It is a symptom of a problem. The problem is low national savings. Council on Competitiveness says, uh, the trade deficit stems from global financial imbalances rather than the inability of American companies to compete in global marketplaces. So you've, you've automatically defined the trade deficit as, oh, it's our fault, we don't save enough. Well, the problem is that that's essentially an equation, savings on one hand, uh, trade deficit on the other hand. It's not a causal factor. It's actually the other way around. The trade deficit is causing low savings, not the other way around. Well, I'm happy to go into more detail on that. So that's the second thing. Third thing is, if you really want to be uh, in denial with this view that markets always get it right, then you have to be able to explain the catastrophic loss of U.S. manufacturing employment. That's the most sort of 
striking thing that's happened? Well, that's very easy for those folks. Uh, Ken Green, uh, who's at AEI, has written, as long as China is selling us the products we need, the location of manufacturing isn't critical to the economy. Uh, Columbia University uh, uh, Jagdish Bhagwati says, anybody who thinks manufacturing is suffering suffers from a manufacturing fetish, which I, I clearly do. Um, Larry Summers, while he was in the White House, said America's role is to feed the global economy that's increasingly based on knowledge and services, not making stuff. Christina Romer, again, Obama, I mean, you want to understand why Obama is doing much more on manufacturing. I'll give you two reasons. Obama, I mean, uh, Larry Summers and Christina Romer are no longer there. People who are there, Gene Sperling and others, get this question much more deeply. But anyway, Christina Romer, after she left the White House, claimed manufacturing don't need special treatment uh, and that there's really no difference between them and, and, and a barber shop. Potato chips, computer chips, what's the difference? Um, and on the last point, you see this argument about manufacturing, uh, they will just simply say, look, we're losing manufacturing jobs because productivity's gone up. And by the way, everybody's losing manufacturing jobs. So again, define away the problem, and then you don't have to really acknowledge that perhaps the core foundation of your economic theory is bankrupt. So Larry Summers, for example, in December 2010, said, uh, you don't succeed by producing things in exactly the same way, uh, as if, by the way, people who are calling out this problem of competitiveness are essentially saying, let's restore the t-shirt industry. Okay, that's not what the argument is about. The argument is about not holding on to old production. The argument is about advancing into new production. You look at where the Germans are. Uh, Germany actually, if you define, if you divide manufacturing output into four groups, high value added, middle high, middle low, and low. Okay, so take your entire manufacturing and put it into those four groups. The Germans actually are about 15 percentage points higher in high value added and mid high value added than America is. America now specializes in low value added manufacturing. And again, this is not, according to this, all of these theories, that's not what's supposed to be going on. So Larry Summers says, there's no going back, technology is accelerating productivity. And then this is the, my favorite quote of Larry Summers of all time. China has seen manufacturing employment decline by more than 10 million jobs over the most recent decade. This is one of those things, it's kind of like, an, this, this is one of those urban myths that, that I, I guarantee you in 20 years people will be saying, you know, China lost manufacturing jobs. Everybody says this now. Well, let me explain what actually happened. If you go back and you got to read, so there's a report that a global consulting firm came out with that said China lost manufacturing jobs. You actually have to understand what really happened there. What really happened there was China changed its statistical system of measuring what they called the manufacturing job. And in the old series, if you were a blacksmith in a little village, a little peasant village in China, you were counted as a manufacturer. Chinese government rightly said, you know, that's not really manufacturing. We're going to take those people out of the statistics starting in 2002 or something like that. And then in 2003, you saw the loss of like 30 million or, you know, an ma amazing number of manufacturing jobs. They didn't lose manufacturing jobs. They reclassified jobs out of manufacturing into something else. In four years, China gained more manufacturing jobs than we have. So the fact that leading economic scholars in the White House, and by the way, it really doesn't matter if Romney wins or Bush or Obama wins, the neoclassical economists are going to dominate any administration. It's not a political thing. The fact that a leading a person who's head of the National Economic Council can repeat essentially what is a falsehood that China lost manufacturing jobs to then excuse the fact that we lost manufacturing jobs, I find really, really quite striking. Because again, if you go back and look at that data series, they didn't lose any manufacturing jobs. They reclassified them. So let me just close by, by saying, you know, I've gone into this sort of long, long litany about why this is a problem. I really do think this is a problem because when you go up and talk on the Hill or what, the White House, for every person who goes up and talks about competitiveness, there are 10 people who go up and say, everything's fine, leave it to the market. The most government should do is, you know, just make sure our education system works, make sure the taxes aren't too bad, make sure we sign more trade agreements, 
you know, maybe expand NSF funding. That's kind of the most you'll get. And even that, a lot of them won't, won't advocate for. So essentially what we need is this Washington innovation consensus that says we compete with other countries, we're losing, Innovation is the most central part of economic competitiveness, whether it's innovation in making a new uh, iPad or a new production process or a new business model. And that absent government proactive innovation policies, we will have be suboptimal on the production of innovation and our ability to compete. So with that, I'll stop. Michael, thank you. That's it, that's it. Well, much to my uh, delight, uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, to my delight, Rob ended his presentation with a picture of a light bulb, uh, bringing to mind the old joke of how many neoclassical economists does it take to unscrew a light bulb? The answer is none. If it needed to be replaced, the market would do it. So uh, <laughs> uh, I don't want to spend too much time on, on the theoretical aspect, but I do want to ask you a question. It's more of a historical sociological question than anything else. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, Paul Krugman, uh, another economist named Elpinen, and others came up with what was called the new trade theory or strategic trade theory. Uh, the, there had been a Heckscher Olin theory about factor endowments before that. But uh, to this day, most uh, economists and most students are taught the theory of comparative advantage, not absolute advantage, but comparative advantage, going back to David Ricardo in the early 1800s. Uh, the new uh, trade theory said that. In an industrial economy, uh, the most uh, uh, advanced and important industries tend to have increasing returns to scale. You know, you mentioned aerospace, you know, steel. The larger your market, the larger your uh, factories can be, the larger the actual, you know, the, the steel vat or the, the, the uh, production um, machinery, uh, th the lower the cost of each, you know, uh, additional unit of output. Uh, the upshot was that uh, a country which got a head start for whatever reason in one of these particular industries with increasing returns to scale, once it had achieved dominance, it, it wouldn't necessarily even have to protect its own market. So the barriers to entry would be so high for other countries that it could monopolize that industry. And what's more, because it was so productive, in theory, it could make all of the uh, planes or shoes or cars that the rest of the world used, right? So uh, what happened in the 1980s and early 1990s was Whenever anyone pointed out the practical implications of this, which meant that uh, countries, by rigging their markets to promote uh, uh, in, uh, some of their own nationals in these increasing returns to scale industries, they were attacked uh, by economists, including, among others, Paul Krugman, the author of the theory, you know, who, who bitterly attacked people and said, well, this is just a theory. It can't be applied in the real world. While he was arguing that his own theory could not be applied in the real world, South Korea applied it, uh, going as a result of various industrial policies uh, from having no sh uh, commercial shipping industry whatsoever to now it's about 50% uh, uh, exploiting this phenomenon. Uh, it's my impression that to this day, economics courses are teaching the 1817 Ricardo theory instead of this clearly correct 1980s theory. Uh, what, what, is that your impression? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, it, it, it's almost as if we've gone backwards. Because yeah. I think in the 80s, we, we, the early 80s, late 80s, early 90s, we kind of had an apex of sophistication. And then it was kind of almost like that was just too threatening to the status quo. And it, and it became pushed aside and, 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 and put into the closet. I was interviewing uh, for an economist. Uh, Actually, for 18 months, uh, uh, I was one of those people who was keeping the U.S. jobless rate high. And um, finally, I, I was looking for an economist, which I sort of became depressingly convinced was a null set, which was somebody who understood economics and innovation. Uh, I finally found one, uh, Justin Hicks, who now works for me. But I, I interviewed a lot of people. And, and I always remember one of the economists I interviewed was from one of the local universities here, a few blocks away. I won't say who they are, uh, specialized in trade. Uh, theory, and I said, oh, well, what do you think of new trade theory? I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was being taught uh, a few blocks away here, trade theory, and never, ever even got exposed to what new trade theory was. So yeah, it's as though you're problem. teaching the Copernican, I mean, the Ptolemaic theory instead of the Copernican theory yeah. you know, in, in class. Well, well, moving away from theory to narratives, I think that 
most politicians and journalists. They don't understand facts as free-floating things. They have to be incorporated into a story, right? And there are a few stories that are just told over and over again. And this is how people organize the world. We're storytelling animals. And, and so I just want to go down a couple of stories that I think shape uh, our understanding of innovation and uh, manufacturing uh, uh, and get your take on them. One of them, and you've touched on some of this, uh, it's the idea that we can do all of the R&D here and all the innovation here uh, and then just uh, delegate the production to other countries. Uh, what's wrong with that story? So I guarantee you when anybody brings up that story, there's pretty much only one firm that they will talk about, and that's, of course, Apple. Now, I want to explain the Apple story in a second, but I also want to say Apple is really very, very much the exception rather than the rule here. So what's wrong with that story? As I had a uh, senior executive in my office a couple of months ago from a thing called ETRI, the uh, ITRI, excuse me, Industrial Technology Research Institute of Taiwan. Which is an interesting story, by the way. Um, Taiwan and Korea after World War II were not doing very well. We, we saw them as kind of bulwarks against Red China communist takeover. And so we actually funded what became ETRI. Uh, the U.S. government funded that. We also funded the Korea Productivity Center and the Korea Innovation Center. So it was U.S. money that actually helped both of those countries become global leaders. But in any case, we helped fund ETRI. One of the things ETRI did in the 70s is it said, you know, there's this thing called semiconductors. We, we kind of got to get in that game. We don't really know anything about it. So let's go find a semiconductor thing to buy. They found RCA. RCA was like, oh yeah, we can make a boatload of money if we sell you semiconductor, all our semiconductor, you know, IP. And we'll get into something else, uh, which they did, which was bankruptcy. Uh, they yeah. sold <laughs> Etri this stuff. And Etri was making just really low-end commodity chips for a long, long time. You know, and they're like, hey, you know what? Well, and then they were pouring R&D money into this government-funded research, and they worked their way up, worked their way up, worked their way up. And then they started going to American OEMs and saying, hey, you know, we can... Yeah, original equipment. Original equipment makers of computer. We can make this for you. Uh, we'll make the motherboard. We'll make this. We'll make it. And, oh, yeah, we can style assemble this for you. Oh, and by the way, we now know we can do a little chip design. Would you like us to do some chip design? And then all of a sudden you have Acer and you've got companies who are competing directly against American companies. And American companies in some cases became a shell of what they were. And so that's really the problem, Michael. It's not as if these other countries and the companies in them are stupid. They're not like, you know, we're going to sit here and be commodity producers. They, once you begin, uh, there's a wonderful um, uh, Clay Christensen at Harvard Business Review talks about where do threats come from for leading edge competitors. Where they come from are companies that are willing to go in at the bottom end and take the low margin stuff. And then companies are going, oh, well, they're taking the low margin stuff, those suckers. They take the low margin stuff, they gain advantage, they gain market share, they keep moving up, keep moving up. And eventually the, the big companies like surprise. So the Apple story, by the way, they, just to be clear, this is one of those things that just, I, I, I really it, it's, wish people would actually read the study the, and, and read it in total completion where all of this stuff about, oh, Apple gets all the value, China gets none of the value. That's a study by a guy named Ken Kramer, who's an affiliated expert of ITIF. And uh, it's a very good study, uh, but people don't really read the study. And what the study shows is actually about half of the value that the cri described to Apple is actually in the retail chain, which we would get no matter what. If, if we were buying foreign computers and they were being sold, we would get that value because you have to have retail distribution. So you can't count that. The other big part of the value chain in the Apple story is it's the inputs the screens, the, the certain types of semiconductors, which are principally made in countries like Taiwan, Japan, and Germany. So yes, uh, don't get me wrong, Apple's a great company. We get a lot of value out of them. But uh, they're really the exception rather than the rule, I think. Well, another one of the narratives that we hear, uh, particularly in election season, is that the source of innovation and also jobs is small businesses. Uh, and just we have to shower subsidies and subs on small businesses, eliminate regulations for them, treat them favorably. Uh, the, the data doesn't necessarily support this uh, obsession, it, it, to use a Bhagwati's term, fetish, about uh, small businesses, does it? Yeah, again, this is one of those things that it, it, it really, when you, when you think about sort of uh, the, the intellectual construct of these U.S. debates. It really is striking how an idea can get in the mainstream and it's almost impossible to kill the idea. And that idea about small business 
essentially came from an MIT business sort of economist named David Birch back in the early 80s. And David Birch wrote what became an iconic study. And it said small businesses are responsible for two-thirds of all new jobs. Now, what Armington and Odell and others wrote was actually, it wasn't small businesses, it was small establishments. So the Exxon station on the corner, the McDonald's, uh, the Domino's pizza chain. Uh, it wasn't small businesses, it was small establishments of large corporations. So when we just looked at small establish, small enterprises, in other words, small businesses like ITIF, New America, we actually account for just a slightly bigger share of job growth than we account for in all jobs. So we're, we're not, small businesses don't produce more jobs than large businesses by and large. That's point number one. Point number two, if you look at, uh, as we do in the book, um, there are a number of factors. Who pays higher wages? who tends to have retirement policies, who exports more, who does more R&D, who patents more, who has higher productivity. Big business, not small business. The best area where small business beats uh, big business is they pay significantly higher workers' comp costs. But there's another more serious problem with this fetish on small business that we saw two nights ago in the debate, and that's there's a wonderful um, 60 minute story uh, a few years ago where Sam, uh, no, Scott Pelley goes into Newton, Iowa. Newton, Iowa is where Maytag had this giant factory for decades and decades making washing machines, I believe. They moved that to Mexico. And uh, Scott Pelley's in, in Newton and he's talking to a lot of small companies like um, this guy who has a men's clothing store and a pizza parlor and, and he's just blaming banks. What wrong with American banks that they won't fund these small businesses to get off the ground to, or to get back on their feet. It wasn't a lack of capital, it was a lack of customers that these businesses were suffering from. In other words, when you lose six or seven thousand jobs in a little town where they were bringing money in that they then spent at clothing stores, it doesn't matter if you give these companies money, they're not going to have customers. So the point is what really matters to the U.S. economy is our traded sector. This is another neoclassical economist refused to distinguish between non-traded and traded. It really fundamentally doesn't matter to our pizza industry uh, or to our haircut industry uh, or to our uh, massage uh, therapy industry. What we do, what matters is, is gr fast growing globalized companies are those competitive and growing in the U.S. If they're growing, then the rest of the economy works. If they're not, which is what's been happening, the rest of the economy doesn't work. So it, it really is sort of depressing that, that, that there's this, it's almost like you cannot talk about the economy without singing the praises of small business. Well, well the final uh, narrative I want to raise with you before we go to discussions is, uh, and this one tends to be among the friends of manufacturing, among people who would share many of, of uh, your views, uh, but it's the idea that there's one magic bullet one dial or knob that you can turn that will solve this problem. So if you pass a bill, you know, challenging China currency manipulation, that then, then that will fix the problem. You know, if you fix the corporate income tax, it's some kind of panacea. And you use the term uh, in your presentation, and, and I assume in the book, uh, of suites of policies by other governments. Uh, and, and could you elaborate on that, just so there is no single one, two, or three things that can be done overnight to, yeah, I mean, to alter we, the situation. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, we have what we call in the book the four T's, uh, which you got to get right. Trade policy, principally going after unfair innovation trade practices. Tax policy, which i come back to just in a second. Technology and talent, so the four T's. you got to get all four of those right, and we're not getting any of them right as it stands right now. I think there's a really, to me, disturbing view, a disturbing conception about what we need to do fostered by some in industry in particular, which is if we just simply got government out of the way, you know, let's just drill for some more oil, let's just, you saw the Washington Post article this morning on tort reform, just cut some corporate taxes, that there would be this renaissance of U.S. manufacturing. Only one big problem with that. Uh, you look at a country like Germany where they are totally out competing us in manufacturing, uh, all the data show that, output growth, job growth, uh, their wages in dollar denominated terms are 40% higher than American wages. So you fix all of these other problems, you might you, at best get half of that delta. You might, you might get a 20% reduction in cost. At most, you've still got 20 So we, 
problem, no, this notion somehow that we're just, U.S. companies are really, really good. We just, we just are burdened by this problem is, is really fallacious. And here's one of the reasons why that's the case. Uh, one of the points in the book we, we point out is that one of the 20 factors the U.S. and the Britain had in common was essentially a corporate culture driven by the finance industry that demanded short-term profits. That is not the case in Germany. That is not the case in Japan. They are not under the gun to get quarterly returns. They're under the gun to get moderate-term returns. So there's a study done by the Business Roundtable that, isn't that that socialist group here? here? The, <laughs> le the left-wing Business Roundtable that surveyed 400 CFOs of major U.S. corporations and asked them, how many of you would cut your research and development this quarter in order to meet Wall Street's expectations? 80% said they would cut their R&D to meet next quarter's earnings targets. You don't see that in Germany. You don't see that in Austria. You don't see that in Sweden or Japan. So this notion somehow we just sort of do a little teeny piece, uh, it, it, it got, needs to be a much more comprehensive solution than that. Well, let's uh, turn to a discussion with questions from the audience. Uh, would you please wait until the microphone uh, has arrived in your vicinity and identify yourself? Up here, second row. Hi, my name is Valerie Vizzani, Embassy of Austria. Um, you mentioned Germany before and also Austria and Finland, so I was particularly interested if there anything you think the U.S. could learn from these particularly smaller countries like, you know, Switzerland, Austria, Scandinavia? Yeah, I mean, one of the problems we have is that Whenever you, uh, Germany's a little bit different, but whenever you say, you know, Finland's doing this great stuff, or boy, Austria's really, really good, you're just dismissed because, oh, well, these are small countries. Um, you know, uh, sorry, the challenge of making a highly competitive industrial economy, innovation economy, is no different in a small country than it is in a big country. Uh, so what we can learn from those countries, I think, is several things. One is, uh, those countries largely are willing to take big, bold steps. So you take Sweden, for example. Sweden, um, actually Finland's even, let me, let me do Finland answer quickly. In 1991 and two, when the Soviet Union was collapsing, the Finnish economy collapsed, and it declined twice as much as the U.S. economy did in, the, in, in our great recession, twice as much, twice as big a GDP loss. What did they do? They didn't have some debate about austerity and uh, stimulus. What they did is they, in the midst of a big budget deficit, they cut their corporate tax rate about 10 points. And, and they dramatically increased their investment in new technology and government support for research. And then they went and they cut other spending. Look at Sweden, for example. Sweden just announced last week that it was cutting its corporate tax rate from 28, I'm getting the numbers slightly wrong, but around 28 to around 22% because they realize they've got to be more competitive. They're also announcing very, very shortly a new national initiative on science and technology where I've been told will also incorporate big investments, a big increase in government investment. But specifically, a country like Germany or, or Austria, one of the things we could learn is that they have a very, very good apprenticeship program that companies are all bought into. 30% uh, of Siemens employees, new employees in Germany are apprentices who have a BS in engineering. I mean, think about that. That's striking. Uh, another thing we could learn from Sweden, uh, from Switzerland, for example, is the patent box. You now have six European countries that tax income from intellectual property at a rate of approximately half to a third of normal income. I mean, again, Austria, I'm sorry, Sweden, Netherlands, Belgium, UK, big, big, dramatic in incentives and innovations and changes. And we're just, again, sitting on the sidelines. So there's an awful lot we can learn from other countries. Now, that's not to say that we're going to do everything the same as other countries. We're different. We have a different political culture. But again, going to the other extreme, that there's nothing we can learn from other countries because we're unique, I think is equally a fallacious mistake. Other questions? Hi, Chris Morehouse, GAO. Um, one thing I haven't heard uh, addressed this morning is how would you respond to uh, like Tyler Cohen, uh, his assertion that innovation may have reached a plateau, that current innovations represent refinements of existing technologies, that we don't have the kinds of innovations anymore that, that will generate um, mass employment? 
Thank you. Yeah, so Tyler and I debated that point, and um, I think what Tyler is conflating is the American stagnation on innovation with, uh, with world stagnation. And I think the more uh, accurate story is not that we don't have innovation, but that the United States is not performing as well as it used to. If you look, if you look at, um, for example, um, and one other piece of that, I think, is I was on a panel with Clay Christensen recently, and Clay made this point, which I think is absolutely right. If you look at where U.S. corporations are investing, they're very, very cautious. They're investing largely in incremental innovation. We were the only country that we could find when we found data on this. If you look at the change over the last decade in where corporations invest their R&D, so think about a pie with three slices, basic, applied and development. And basic and applied are going to be more breakthrough, bigger, bigger risks, bigger payoffs. The U.S. is the only country where the basic and applied pie slices have gotten smaller. Other countries were either stable, their companies were stable, or they expanded. So I think the issue really is more about the U.S. Um, there's an amazing amount of innovations that are still going on, the genetic sequencing, um, there's, there are in clean energy innovations that are happening. I think people are still underestimating what's happening in IT. You know, partly it's just because we sort of, you know, we still have smartphones and they haven't, you know, although the Apple 5 is, or 6 or 7, or whatever it is, is uh, nice, but yeah, it's, not as, it's not as dramatic as Apple 1, you know, the 5. But again, if you look at some of the big changes in IT, I think things like big data, uh, things like transforming our healthcare system through IT, um, you can go to countries where they have uh, hardly anybody uses cash anymore. They use their cell phone for, for money. We don't do that in this country. So I, I really disagree with Tyler. I, I think that there's still a good share of innovation that's possible and is going to happen. The real question is, are we going to be at the leading edge of it or not? Well, in connection with this, I'd like to ask uh, your thoughts on the idea that uh, particular technologies go through life cycles or, or stages of maturation. And you may have an infant technology here, an adolescent one there, a mature one, and maybe a senescent one over here that's just become kind of commodity production. Uh, and that was my one quibble with your uh, indices and in, in your presentation about the decline of venture capital, because uh, it seems to, uh, uh, historically, venture capital tends to be most important at the infant breakthrough stage. Uh, you know, 1900, when you have hundreds of little tiny car startups and, and, you know, tech startups in the 90s. And as you get, because these are high value added, increasing returns to scale industries, you get consolidation in big companies. Then the baton is passed from the venture capitalists to a, a large degree to uh, internal financing by, by the companies through, through retained uh, earnings. Yeah, no, Mike, I absolutely agree, and as you, you were kind enough to cite a prior book I did on, on long waves of innovation, and I think that's, I, I fully agree with that, that, that innovation go through cycles, and at some point, we're going to be in the Tyler Cowen world. Um, I just don't think that's right now. I think the Tyler Cowen world, which is essentially stagnation of innovation, waiting till the next big thing happens, I don't think we're there yet I, as a planet. I think we're still 10 years away from that. Um, and I I'll fully agree with, with, with you, Mike, on that point about venture capital. But again, if you look at other countries, their venture capital increased. Is this private or uh, private, public? Private, private venture public. capital. So I think there are still a lot of opportunities. What we have failed to do in the U.S., think about where the world, think about where America would be if we, after 1987, had kept on the same path of growth of government support for science and research that we had prior to 1987. So just, just think about that as a share of our economy. We were growing at this rate from 57 to 87. Corporate R&D was growing at this rate. Corporate R&D continued to grow at this rate until about five years ago. We are, we're about $110 billion short at of federal R&D. In other words, a massive amount. Think about where the U.S. would be if we had been investing $110 billion in R&D every decade, every year, for the last 15 years, more than what we're doing today, and we had good policies to transfer that technology out into the market, I would submit that the venture industry would be in a lot better shape than it is today. Yes, other questions? <laughs>
Hi. Is this on? Okay. Rachel Bishop, American Chemical Society. Um, very interesting. I appreciate it. Uh, was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about the the qualitative difference between uh, American innovation and Germany's innovation. Um, I, I'm hearing one of the things that, that we oftentimes uh, are talking about, about breakthrough innovation. But I'm wondering if there isn't a value in some of the things that are not um, game changing. Some of uh, some of the intermediate uh, innovations that maybe we're missing uh, is one area that I'd love to hear about. Uh, and the other question that I have is, why do we keep talking about small business and big business as separate things? Small business has to sell to somebody. They sell a lot to big business. Why why don't we make this connection in our our public discussion? Thank you. Okay, Rachel, yeah, with regard to the first question, you know, one of the reasons I think this, well, there's two possible explanations for why our narrative has not been becoming more of a dominant narrative. One is we're simply wrong. That's certainly in the realm of possibility. But the second is that, there, that, that, that it's hard to, uh, hard to conceive that the U.S. is not a leader in innovation. And I think there's two reasons why that's hard for people, three reasons why it's hard for people. One, we're just so big. So if you just look and say, well, you know, let's count up some innovations, we're going to get a lot of them because we're so big. You, know? you compare the number of innovations coming out of the U.S. with the number coming out of Finland, and we totally just kick their ass. We, are, you know, we produce so much more innovation than Finland. But we're also 15, 20 times bigger than Finland. That's number one. Number two is we don't distinguish between companies and countries. U.S. companies are still very innovative. Uh, GE, Apple, Intel. That's not what matters as much. What matters is, is enterprises, excuse me, establishments. So while U.S. companies are innovative, they're doing less high value added production and less innovation in America. U.S. corporate R&D grew 2.7 times faster overseas in the last decade than our corporate R&D grew in the U.S. So that's what, and the third problem I think is that, to be fair, one area where the U.S. does pretty well is science-based innovation. And we get that. We're, we're a more entrepreneurial country than, we're certainly more entrepreneurial than the Germans. We're much more entrepreneurial than the Japanese. So we have this ability to take science take big risks and come up with new companies. I, I absolutely get that, and that's a great strength. The problem is that science innovation is not enough to succeed anymore. And this is, I think, a big mistake that people make when they advocate for policies. They say, if we just expand our science funding, we'll be good to go. The problem with that is science is a public good. You read about science in a journal. You can read the same journals in Taiwan as you can read here. Again, I go back to my, my ITRI uh, official. One of the things he was complaining about, it was just hilarious to listen to this, this, this official, he was complaining that the university researchers he worked with f focused too much on basic research. Like, wow, could you move to our country and, and say that? And the problem is that the U.S. system, the, what the Germans have over us and what the Japanese have over us and the Koreans, is they have a great engineering system. They have a great engineering culture. We've really lost that engineering capability. And again, you can't be as big as us. I mean, if we were Denmark, maybe we could just be the science-based country. But being so big, you have to have the strengths in science and engineering. So one of the things that the Germans do, uh, that's also another thing, by the way. The Germans are great on a lot of things you've never heard of because you don't buy them. There are intermediate products that go into, there are certain types of chemicals, there are certain types of inputs. You know, we, again, we see the iPhone, we don't, we don't, you know, how many people have taken their iPhone apart and go, oh, I see that little product has a made in Germany thing on it. So it's hard to see a lot of that stuff because the, a lot of these other countries are great. You look at Japan, for example, there's a McKinsey study on this that showed Japan leads the world with over 70% global market share on over 70 high-tech industries. 70% global market share. Now, we don't really know what most of those industries are because they're things like uh, lasers. And I don't know whether they're lasers, but they're things like lasers. You know, they're things we don't sort of see. 
So I really think one of the most important things we could do is really start to beef up our engineering capabilities. We, pr we produce fewer bachelors of science engineers than we did 25 years ago, even though overall bachelor's degrees have gone up about 40 or 50 percent. One of the ideas that we've proposed is creating essentially a 21st century Morrell Act. Uh, Morrell was a senator from Vermont. Michael, you make this point about all the good things we did in, 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 the, in the 1860s because we didn't have, we had a government who was... We didn't have the South and the Senate. Yes, I was trying to say that. Uh, <laughs> you said it. I, For four years. Exactly. <laughs> and so we did all these amazing things. We built the Transcontinental Railway System. And we passed the Morrell Act. The Morrell Act created the land-grant schools. You know, probably one of the most important things we've ever done in our country's history. Our argument is we need a 21st century Morrell Act. We've called for the creation of 20 U.S. manufacturing universities, universities that would be designated you know, like Lehigh, for example, or Carnegie Mellon, or Purdue, whatever, really focused on expanding engineering capabilities, getting their business schools to integrate with them and like. So we gotta, we, we've got to get a much better capabilities on those sorts of things. I think another thing we could do there would be to expand, or excuse me, not expand, create an investment tax credit. We need to reward U.S. companies that invest in new machinery, equipment, and software in the United States. Now, if you talk to some of the neoclassical economists I've, I've, I've listed in the thing, they will say there is no market failure for capital equipment investment. Companies gain all of the benefits and the market directs incentives properly. In fact, what's really interesting is what you find in the last decade is that there's a really rich array of scholarly literature that says that when a company buys a new machine, it actually doesn't get anywhere near all the benefits from it. The benefits flow through to their competitors who learn about it, to their suppliers, to the workers who know how to use it and then move on to a new firm. And companies only get about half of the benefits when they invest in new machinery and equipment. They get all the benefits when they invest in a new building. There's no spillovers from buildings, but there are big spillovers from equipment and software. So why don't we treat equipment and software the same way we treat research and development expenditures, which is a tax incentive, a tax credit. So I think if we did those sorts of things and really focused again on engineering and investment in machinery and equipment and software, we could really do quite, 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 quite well. Uh, one of your four T's was trade, and, and since nobody's asked the question, I'm going to follow up on this. Uh, Martin Wolf, the Financial Times columnist, says that mercantilism, that is a national policy of running perpetual trade surpluses in, in high value added uh, merchandise, can only work if you have what he calls a patsy. Another country, like the United States, vis-a-vis -vis Germany and Japan and China, which will agree to run perpetual trade deficits. Uh, the system of mercantilism cannot work if every single industrial country wants to run a 10, 5 or 10 percent trade surplus with the rest of the world, right? Uh, and you know, that's one of the arguments that, well, if, if competitiveness is defined on the model of these foreign mercantilist trade surplus countries, then doesn't that lead to beggar thy neighbor, trade wars, you know, protectionist blocks, all of that? Uh, you mentioned the Indian uh, preferential market access agreement. Uh, would you comment on the idea that you could have a kind of mutually assured destruction, non-zero-sum uh, system, where you would exploit the economies of scale that you get in global corporations, which may very well be more efficient than purely national ones, but by having local content, because that's essentially what that is, if, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. essentially local content rules. So you say, look, it may make sense for there to be two global aircraft manufacturers, right? Or maybe one global shipper, you know, uh, or something like that. But on the other hand, as it, it, we want, at least in regions like Europe and North America and Asia, it may not be every single country, we want a certain amount of the high value added production to be located within this region, whether or not, you know, neoclassical economists would, would, say, would say that. And it seems to me that's different from the zero-sum approach uh, of, of, of every single country, every major industrial country is trying to corner the market in every industry. Yeah. Is it? Uh, it is different. Um, so there's actually a bunch of different points there, but one, um, a uh, 
was recently, I was talking to somebody recently who had been in the Obama administration who was telling me about a conversation a few years ago, which again, the administration has completely changed its view here, which is good. But the conversation essentially went like this. If the Chinese are willing to be so stupid as to give us discounted solar panels and discounted wind turbines, they're the suckers, we're, we're the beneficiaries. And again, this is, this is deeply, deeply the core of neoclassical economics, which is grounded on the notion of consumer welfare. The purpose of an economy is to maximize consumer welfare. The problem with that view fundamentally is how many of you are consumers? You all got to raise your hands. How many of you are also producers? In other words, how many of you work? Again, you're a producer and a consumer. The only people who are not are kids and old people. So if you want to run an economy for kids and old people, keep running a big trade deficit. And investors. Yeah, and investors. Uh, passive investors. There you go. Yeah. So anyway, so the point is you have to be thinking about the producer side. And, and you know, we can't keep being the patsy. But the other part of that, uh, Michael, is I think um, we, we talk a little bit at the end of the book, I, I hate to use this sort of term, but this yin-yang, I guess, about it. If you think about what is the U.S. strength compared to, say, China or Japan or even Germany, if you divide your economy into two groups, traded sectors and non-traded sectors, we actually have a, pretty much the best non-traded sector in the world. Our productivity is the highest. We, we, U.S. companies spend more, about twice as much on IT than Japanese companies do. We have, you know, CRM systems. We, you know, our logistics are, you know, you go to a hotel here versus a hotel in Europe. Uh, it's just, you know, to me it's striking. You, you know, our Walmart versus their retail. We have a great non-traded sector, which is why we have high per capita income. Where we don't have a good thing is we don't have a good, our traded sector is losing out. China and Japan, to some extent Germany, it's the flip side. It's their non-traded sectors that they've protected and you know, kept from competition, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at China, for example, China has a thing now they've called uh, their Strategic and Emerging Industries Initiative. So what they've done is they've identified eight industries that they want to lead the world on. It's these, it's these, uh, you know, these industries with low marginal cost and, and, and declining returns, increasing returns to scale, clean energy, advanced manufacturing, biotechnology, et cetera. The Chinese government has committed to investing the equivalent of one U.S. stimulus package per year, per five years, to eight industries. So we invested at one stimulus package of which very little of it really went to industry. Most of it was consumer tax cuts and things. The Chinese are investing every year in five of those, five, five stimulus packages, because they want to get these high value added industries. Okay, they essentially want to take their value added from around 6% to 20%. So you go and you do a calculation, which we did in the book, and you say, what would happen if the Chinese were to succeed with that goal? What if they get to that level of value added? they would achieve essentially 14 months of growth. In other words, it's equivalent of over a 10-year period getting 14 months of growth. So my argument is that the problem with Korea, the problem with China, the problem with Japan, and Asia overall, is their, uh, their theory of economic growth is really fallacious. Where China... So you're not endorsing this, right? What? Well, I mean, that's just a point I wanted to tease out of you, that you're not endorsing their... Mercantilist. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm not. I actually think that they're making a mistake because if you look at China, India's an even better example, the rampant amount of overmanning and, and just abysmal productivity in their non-traded sectors. Again, there's a great McKinsey study uh, that Bill Lewis did in a book called The Power of Productivity. He looked at J Japanese industries and compared with 100 being the benchmark against us. Most of their traded sectors were like 120, 130, 140. Their auto sector, 140. Their steel sector, 130. Their uh, retail distribution sector, 45. <laughs> their medical industry, 50, something like that. So again, these countries have gone down a path that's all about high value added. We're going to export, export, export. And that, to me, is the big mistake. That's what we need to be telling. That should be the Washington consensus, not... The so hey, last point, Michael. I don't have a problem with these, at, at the same time, with these countries wanting to get more high value added stuff. But I do have this sort of, I don't know where it comes from, this kind of view that maybe we should all play by, by some rules. You know, 
China joined the WTO, and in the WTO, you're supposed to not discriminate. If, if they'd signed the GPA, the government procurement, you're not supposed to do forced technology transfer. You're not supposed to do joint, forced joint ventures. So, look, I really want China to get rich. I, I, I want India to get rich. I don't want them to get rich in this particular way. So if they want to do that through, you know, getting really great Fraunhofer institutes in China, mm -hmm. go for it. Beautiful. Out-compete us. We, it's, uh, then it's incumbent upon us to put in Fraunhofer, these are these industry university institutes. They want to do it by a better R&D credit. So I think there's a way, Michael, of competing that essentially raises everybody's game, forces us to compete in a good way, forces them to compete even more, more innovation. That's what I think we should all be striving for. But what they would say is that uh, we cheated all the way until 1945, and now we're changing the rules. Uh, one more question, and then uh, Dr. Atkinson uh, has some books, uh, uh, if you're interested, sure. uh, to, that we can sell and he can sign. Uh, final questions, thoughts, comments? Hi. I've never spoken into one of these before. Um, I'm Brian Webster, Middle East Institute. You mentioned that um, our trade imbalance was affecting our savings rate. Um, I think I know where you're going with that, but could you flush that out a little bit more? So there's this notion, I mean, this is, a, this is essentially, um, if you look at what it is our savings rate is and the amount of money we invest, it, it, it has to be equal to um, the trade imbalance because it's, it's all an accounting uh, 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 equation. So therefore, in other words, let's just say, so, so, so we're investing a lot in housing. We don't have the money. Where did that money come from? Turns out that money came largely from the Chinese. So there's actually a one-to-one -one correlation of the growth in housing uh, investment and the growth of the uh, Chinese trade deficit, one-to-one. -one. So in other words, we give them, excuse me, they give us uh, DVD players they give us assembled iPads, uh, they give us um, toys, whatever the Chinese export to us, and we give them a piece of paper with the president's picture on it. Okay, so essentially, it's a very perverse system if you think about it. We have, we have a per capita income that's uh, perhaps seven times more than the Chinese, and we're loaning them money. Excuse me, they're loaning us money. So what happens is that money comes in, and then people think, okay, well, it's coming in because we, there's no way we can finance uh, our trade def, our, excuse me, our investment. So uh, if we could, uh, we, the, we, would, we wouldn't be having to import all this money. And the problem with that is, number one, let's just say hypothetically that we don't run a trade deficit anymore, and the Chinese and the, you know, other countries don't export all of this money to us, and these goods, and, then, and have all this money. And so we have less capital. So there's, there's, a, there's a reduction in the capital supply. We have to somehow, you know, we've got to find it more capital. W two things are going to happen. One is we, we would have spent less money on houses. So the demand for capital would have gone down. But number two is the price of capital would have gone up. In other words, interest rates would have gone up. And I think this is where neoclassical kind of miss, miss kind of the most fundamental thing that they, the one thing they're really good at uh, is understanding supply and demand curves. And if prices goes up, uh, supply should go up. So why do we none of us save anymore? Because you make less than a quarter of a percent interest. So if we don't have all this money flowing in from overseas, we will have more savings. So the notion somehow that there's, this, that there's no response in the marketplace, I think, is fallacious. Number two, one of the reasons we don't save as much is because so many workers are losing their jobs and going into lower wage jobs. If the economy was healthier, we would have more savings. So I think, again, another good example of that, if you look at, if you remember that graph where you saw in the 90s where uh, the trade deficit was exploding, back in the 90s you would have the Peterson Institute and a whole set of institutions in Washington that abided by the Washington consensus who told this story, which was if we just start running a trade, a, a budget surplus, the trade, value, the trade, deficit would go away because those two things are linked, right? It's almost mechanistic. If we just saved more, by definition, we will stop importing. Now, what happened was we actually ran a huge budget surplus, unprecedented. 
<laughs> and the trade deficit actually Well, it never made any sense whatsoever that if we saved more, then we would export more. That the cause and effect, obviously, was yeah. crazy. Yeah. And the, the, yeah. the other way to think about that, let's just say hypothetically that we decided to increase corporate taxes to 75%. In the neoclassical theory, that has absolutely cannot have an impact on our trade deficit because it's all a function of savings rates. So you could hobble U.S. corporations. We could put in place a rule that says every major factory in the U.S. has to, uh, has to put in uh, five massage therapists for every worker. And you could sort of increase their cost by double. You're not going to have any effect on the trade deficit because it's all about savings. So that's kind of, to me, the, mech the mechanistic fallacy that they have. It just is it, no sort of real underlying relationship to real enterprises, real producers, in real competition. And that goes to this overall, I think, failure of neoclassical economics. Is neoclassical economics is all up here. Uh, I remember if you, somebody, if somebody t asked a question about um, um, uh, Tyler Cowen's <coughs> recent book, uh, The Great Stagnation. <coughs> Well, the new stagnationist article is by Robert Gordon. It just came out a week ago. And Robert Gordon's one of those guys where it's like when your watch is broken, you're, you're correct twice a day. Robert Gordon, for those of you who don't know him, an economist, um, he, was, he was the number one naysayer of the U.S. productivity growth miracle in the late 90s. It wasn't real. It was all nonsense. And after about eight years of evidence staring him in the face saying that perhaps he's wrong, he recanted and said, I'm wrong. But he was just kind of waiting for productivity to go down. Now he's like, I'm back. Productivity is a failure. And so the problem is when you talk to people like Robert Gordon or other economists like that and you say, have you ever been in the latest factory that's deploying the most automated, uh, automated control systems? No. Have you ever looked at sort of what's the most coolest uh, ERP systems in the world that are being deployed in U.S. companies? No. I do know, though, what our interest rates are. I do know what our savings rates are. In other words, the problem with neoclassical economists is they're operating up here. They really need to operate here. What was going to make or break the U.S. economy is what our, what our organizations do. In other words, what our government organizations, nonprofit organizations, and private organizations do. If they are really productive, if they're really innovative, we're going to do great. If they're not, we're not going to do great. Now, all of these things circling around up here, interest rates, deficits, yeah, those have some, there's an arrow that's dotted and it goes around and eventually makes an impact. But it's not really the central thing. The central thing is much more about what are we doing to make this ecosystem for our organizations work. And um, we're not there. The book is Innovation Economics by Dr. Robert Atkinson and Stephen Azell. It's on sale outside. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Atkinson. Thank you. I'll do it.